Hi everyone, I'm Wendy Yi. I'm Chris Yi. And today we're going to be reviewing CO2 Second Chance, the cooperative version. This is a Vital Asserta game put out by Stronghold Games and GeoChix. Uh, we'll be giving you the overview and not explaining every rule because these are big involved games, but we'll show you roughly how it plays, the cooperative version of the game, and then we'll come back and give our thoughts. an example setup of CO2 Second Chance on the cooperative side of the board since this is the recommended main mode of play in the book and this is a setup for a two-player game. What you'll see here this is your player area with these really useful uh, explanations as to what your main and executive actions are. Each turn you'll take one main action either proposing, the, proposing a power plant out into a region uh, or you'll be able to actually infrastructure it which is the second step which is to take one of your infrastructure tokens, put it onto here and flip it over so it's two thirds complete. Or the last action that you can take is to actually build the power plant, at which point you'll take a matching power plant of the type and you will place it onto there. Thus, you have a completed power plant of renewable clean energy. The point of the game is of course to keep the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere low enough that you will win uh, across the four decades over there in the corner. But to do this, you'll also have to meet some objectives here set by UN cards, and you'll have to complete personal objectives in your hand. That's the win condition. Complete at least one of these two personal conditions, stay alive for four decades, and have no more than three of these cards phased up. How do you complete these cards? Well, one player has to have the infrastructure for the matching types of power plants, in this case, solar. And then if I, as the blue player, were to also have the infrastructure uh, in place for a greenery or a, a forestration plant as this, then as an executive action, I could claim this card. Well, what are the executive actions? Those are those outlined here on the side. A player may, once per turn, take a main action and do up to all three of their executive actions. The first one here, cards. I could either choose to play a card from my hand when I take a corresponding action, such as planning a power plant in, say, Oceania, as I did here. I could have done that to play this card and get this bonus, a CEP, a carbon emission permit, which means that I'm using enough clean energy that I have permission to do a little bit of polluting. Or you can use this card action if you have enough infrastructure in place to match one of these cards, these gold cards, you can flip it over. You'll get a small reward, but also as long as only three of these are face up at the end, you'll win. The second executive action you can choose to take on your turn is to go to the CEP market. You can buy or sell according to the current price, more or less CEP, so that you can have more money or that you can have more of this resource that you'll need to be able to build things or to infrastructure things. The last thing that you can do on your turn is you can move a scientist. If there is a planned or a proposed uh, type of power plant, you can move your available scientist onto it. Or on a future turn, you can move a scientist off of it, say to another type of proposed, uh, uh, proposed plant. And when you do that, you'll move up your knowledge in that track. Moving up knowledge is good because you need to reach certain levels to be able to build them. And these numbers at the top here represent amount of income that you'll get at the end of each round. Also, if you move a scientist by any means, either by taking the move action, uh, executive action, or by taking the infrastructure main action, which will cause this to flip over, your scientist will move out of there. And they can either move to a played card to get a, a small bonus, but they're permanently gone from the game. They can move to another proposed plant, or they can move over here to one of these matching, uh, uh, what are these called? These are the... Uh, summits, the planned summits that you can speak at in such important cities as Essen or Lisboa or any of these other uh, important cities. When there are enough scientists here between one or both players, you'll also move up the knowledge tracks there and then you'll complete this uh, summit, which will give you more knowledge and flip over some of these tiles. So what's going on over here? At the end of each round, players will have to spend points that they earn from building 
these power plants of renewable energy, they'll have to lose points at the end of each round. What do they lose them from? Anything unflipped over here. Uh, so these are built power plants. You see that I built a solar plant, so that will flip over, in Oceania, so that would flip over. I also built one in South America, so that would flip over, and it was a hydraulic plant or a, uh, or a dam. So more of these flip over. If you move up the knowledge tracks over here on the side, you can get to the halfway point, the pink area, and flip some of these over. If you get to the end of tracks, you flip over other ones. And when you complete summits of certain types, you can also flip over these tiles. So a recycling and a hydrology summit that had two different types on it. So as you can see, some of these are more complicated than others to do, but those are done and will get replaced. So at the end of all of your actions and after everything else, you'll move to the income phase. So based on your knowledge level on different tracks, whoever's furthest ahead will earn that much income either as victory points or as money. Money obviously being needed to be spent to build up more plants. But if you don't have enough points after subtracting all of the points for these and more points will need to be spent as these uh, dirty fossil fuels will come out to the regions that didn't have power plants built and the, into them this turn. So five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the carbon dioxide in the air will rise 90 parts per million. And therefore at the end of the first round, you have to spend one point for each one that you want to reduce it. If at any point between this, uh, the CO2 and these objective tiles, your marker goes below zero, you have lost the game. On top of that, the first round, everything costs you one victory point to offset. At the end of the second round, everything incomplete and carbon dioxide costs two victory points, three the third round, four the fourth round. So therefore, the only way to win is to make it through all four decades of the game and to complete a personal objective, every single player, and to flip over all of these tiles without losing in time. And that is CO2 second edition. So let's go ahead and start with the methane producing elephant in the room. This game is gorgeous. It is, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, the components and everything, fantastic, right? Oh, they are. The, the way that the power plants work step by step as you're building them and the interlocking pieces, very, very cool. Yeah, and, and visually it's a nice treat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tool is a regarded uh, illustrator and graphic designer and everything. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that he did for this game, very good. I don't have really any complaints about it. Although it's funny because playing this directly next to some of the other like deluxe games that come out, I look at some of the things and I'm like, well, this little bit of cardboard could be smoother. And I think, no, why am I, why am I saying that? <laughs> so this is a gorgeous printing of it. Yes. Uh, and so we've played the, the cooperative version. That's what is recommended. That's like the main go-to version in the rule book for Second Chance or the second edition of CO2. Mm -hmm. And we love it. It's great. So what are some things that you love about it? So... I appreciate that this is a game that I would say is kind of unlike any other, right? A lot of times, you know, you, in your mind, compare games to each other. You say, oh, I see where this mechanism is from, from mm -hmm. maybe inspired by this or whatever. I don't think there really is. This is obviously an action selection, right? You saw you choose one of three actions each turn, but the actions are really simple. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. this is not borrowing much from something else I can see. It's a, or I should say it's a very unique experience the whole way through. I think it is, and it is what I had been waiting for when it came to cooperative games. I'm one of those people that I like the really heavy, crunchy games, but I also really love the collaboration that happens in cooperative games. And so many of them have like an ideal thing to do. And I feel like this is an efficiency puzzle that really gets you thinking and working together and there's so much going on and so many things you have to work on on the board. Um, but it's, it's doing it with your buddy. It's doing it with your friend. You're working together to save the world. And I, I oh, love that. Oh, he's my buddy. Yeah. No, I, I really enjoy gaming with Chris. It's one of those games that, that I could see, you know, alpha gamers could take over and say, okay, this is exactly how we're going to do this. Take your turn. Um, but working together, I think it's so much fun and it's exactly what I've wanted in a cooperative game, something that's heavy and just rich and so much going on. Some games, some cooperative games, do unique approaches where there's hidden information or whatever, so that one mm -hmm. person can't boss everyone around. This one 
almost everything is out on the table, it addresses that by simply being so complex. Like, not, <laughs> not rules complex, I should say. The yeah. rules, although, as you saw from the overview, are, you know, there's, there's a lot of rules. But once you get going, not bad, right? The gameplay is, is manageable. But then the puzzle, the equation that you're trying to balance in all of this, right? meeting those UN objective cards uh -huh. and flipping over those objective tokens and building sensible power plants along the way are all difficult things that I think one person at the table couldn't just sit there and go, I know what to do. <laughs> I, the great thinker and card counter of them all, have perfect <laughs> memory. So, I don't know, maybe this game isn't for people who have, you know, those eidetic memories or whatever. Sure, I mean, yeah, it's not even about memory, it's about solving this very it's, difficult problem. Yeah, it, it is, it's beautiful. And a lot of, like you said, a lot of cooperative games have uh, hidden information, or they have bad stuff that comes out every round. And this has that, but all that it is is just these fossil fuel tiles, you know, are going to be minus 20 or up to minus 50. It's so minimal when you look at everything that you have to balance. You know stuff is going to come out, you know, it's going to be about 30 or 40, give or take. And you just calculate that in as you're planning this whole big, I don't know, this whole big puzzle. I think that this is not going to be a game for some people who want a little bit more excitement, right? An event deck. Sure. You flip a card, the nuclear power plant explodes, right? No. That's not Doesn't what happen. in this game. Yeah. You know, there's no event. It's literally, like you said, just those tiles, yeah. right? But it does address having uh, hidden unique action cards, right? One of the executive yes. actions you take, cards. Uh, hey, I did the uh, propose a plan in Oceania. I get to plan. I get to put out this card, which gives us a small bonus, right? Mm -hmm. So if one person at the table does say, "Hey, this is what you need to do on your turn. You need to do this on your turn," you can say, you know, this, it's almost like a, a tiny bargaining chip to say, "I actually am going to be the person to do this." Why is that? Yeah, hand of cards. You're like efficiency wise, like. You need to build the water plant first. Well, really, if you want to be efficient with my secret cards, then then maybe I shouldn't build the water plant first. I should build the, you know, the solar plant first. Whatever it may be. It's, um, it's almost yeah. silly that it's hidden, but I think it's there for for certain game groups, right? Honestly, you could just play this open face, and it's yeah. not going to change the game really, right? Once someone says, "No, I'm going to do the hydro." Hydraulic plant. Yeah. Oh, do you get a bonus for that? Yes, you do. Oh, okay, okay. great. Jenny's going to do it then. <laughs> yeah. Um, this game can suffer occasionally from feeling like one person is doing a lot for a particular round or two. I know there have been moments where maybe I've had more scientists than Chris because I've invested in that. And then my scientists are the ones who are running around, you know, going on all the proposals. And they're the ones who are going and having the little summit meetings. And <laughs> Chris is like, I don't get to use my executive actions because I don't have any scientists so right. i'm there can be those moments too um but yeah it's 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 very cool the the interaction and the way that that people can work together it yeah interaction yeah. is a key thing here right if this is not a, a co-op game where i play my game and wendy plays hers and we are sort of working towards the same thing yeah. you have to be laser focused from the beginning oh yeah how are we going to work on this together which of those objective tiles do we want to flip over right which of the UN cards are you going to work towards and I am, am I going to work towards? That's not something that you figure out three quarters of the way through the game. <laughs> you do if you fail, you know. Sure. You know. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of those objective tokens, one of the things that's really brilliant about this is the way that points are used. You have to earn points to offset the... The, the, carbon, the, emissions the carbon emissions that come out every year, yep. Right, and if you don't flip over those little objective tokens, then you're spending even more points. Mm -hmm. They cost one point to flip over the... Uh, for each unflipped over one the first round, two in the second, three in the third, four in the fourth. And so, unlike a lot of games where things devalue in later rounds, this one kind of increases in value. It really does. So if I've, you know, I, I need to build a power plant in Africa and I haven't built one yet, every round that's getting more expensive for me, but it also becomes more rewarding when I finally do flip it over. And so, yeah, it, it kind of balances out. Right. So if you accomplish something in the first round, you're over the, the course of the game, you're saving 10 points, right? The one plus the two plus mm -hmm. the three plus the four. But if you do in the last round, you don't sit there and go, well, I've lost so many points already. You say, yay, I flipped over a four-point <laughs> thing. Yeah, that's I great. 
Also to counteract the carbon emissions, you have to spend more every round as well of your points that you're collecting throughout the round. So you want to get as many things done as quickly as possible because they're costing you more and more and more. Yeah, I, I think this is a brilliant game. It thematically works. I really enjoy pretty much every aspect of it. Uh, the, the CEP market, you know, we've kind of fallen into a little rote situation the way that we use that. And so I'm not sure if there's a more dynamic way to do it, but we keep doing well at the game. So. Yeah. I don't know, I really enjoy it. This is, it, this game surprised me how much you really like it. It surprised me how much I really liked it too. I enjoy heavy games and when we played this, I was just like, oh my goodness, this is, this is what I've been waiting for. Please, I want more games. If Vitalosert is watching this, which he's not, but if he is, I want him to make more of these games. I love it. More co-op? Yeah, more, more heavy, thinky, gritty co-ops. Yeah, I love it. So the way that you described this to me was like, this was co-op game gourmet. This is yes, like, this yes. This is like gourmet ice cream. Yeah, it, it's like that. I feel like I was playing like vanilla flavored co-op games, you know. You sorry, work together. Sorry, pandemic. Vanilla <laughs> pandemic. You work together. You save the world. Bad stuff comes out every round. You, you do your save best. Save the world. And there are some games you can win and some games you just can't win. And it just all depends on the cards and how they come out. And, and it's fun that you're working together. Um, but then now I feel like I've had, you know, double chocolate fudge ripple um, deliciousness when it comes to this game. Like, I feel like I never want to go back to plain vanilla. I will. I'll still eat it. I'll still play it. Look, if um, you hand me a cruddy ice cream bar, I'm still going to devour that. Yeah, thing. I'll still eat it. <laughs> I still enjoy those games. But if you're asking me what I want to spend three hours on, if we're going to have, like, date night game night, like, this is one of those games. This is one of my, like top hey let's like really pull out something and and enjoy it let's have that let's crunch chocolate fudge double ripple from ben and jerry's or whatever <laughs> like let's do that yeah not sponsored by ben and jerry's uh, <laughs> no no i i yeah i'm i'm glad that you enjoy this game so much it makes me excited to try other heavier cooperative mm -hmm. games like this because i mean hey, we enjoy uh, still all of the other ones uh, one of our most played games of ever has been the crew, which is not that heavy, but it, yeah, you know, but it's true. we like the cerebral shared experience. And I think that this game does a really good job of taking away the individual stress, right? If you play, Vital Assert is known for making these very crunchy, heavy games. And sometimes if you're the new player at the table, you feel like you're just thrown in the ocean. Yeah. You know, you're left to the wolves, right? <laughs> yeah, you have no chance of winning. You have no chance of like even getting close. Yeah. But this takes that away because you're part of the team now. Yeah. Uh, and even if it's not like versus other experienced players, right? This this was just really approachable for you because I figured out the rules and we and we taught it and then all of a sudden you started coming up with really great ideas. You know, yeah. you came up with better ideas than me, but occasionally I had a few ideas that really helped rise the team up. Yeah. And so it's about both brains or all the brains at the table working together. Yeah, working together, figuring things out, piecing it and it's a lot of fun. So, uh, what score did you give this one? This one I give an 8. This is a game that I really enjoy playing. I, I do enjoy pulling it out. When we have the big, like, hey, we got like 3 or 4 hours tonight, you know, what do we want to do? You know, oh, I could, we could pull off Beast for Odin or Terra of Mars, one of these big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, you say, hey, how about CO2 again? And I think, yeah, I could go for that. I like this one a lot, <laughs> so that, it's an 8 for me. It's an 8 for you? So it is a 9 for me. I, I really love this game, and almost any time that we have an available evening, it's on the list. It's on the short list of like three or four games that I'd be like, well, we could play this one, or we could play some of these other ones. But yeah, it's, it's on that list. I really enjoy it. It gets pulled out quite a bit. Yep. So, yep. so there you go. That's our thoughts on CO2 Second Chance. Uh, my name is Chris Yee. And I'm Wendy Yee. And thanks for watching The Dice Tower.